here this morning, so glad you could be here because Thursday and Friday you wouldn't have been able to get in, I couldn't get in. I had to park up the back street and walk in because the hole was that deep right near our driveway. And guess what? Throughout the week it's going to get back like that again. But Tuesday will be good. Tuesday will be good. The rest of the days, not so much, but by Friday, usual people, it's all going to be seen. <coughs> the curve. Isn't that good? Yeah, I'm so excited about this morning. Glad you could get here because this morning I want to give you some keys, right? Actually, you already have the keys. I want to show you how to use the keys to open the very windows of heaven this morning. Right now, you need to move around which many you can. And so, well, I'm glad I came. He's going to show me how to open the windows of heaven. Move around.
if you want to use Tidely, it makes it so much easier for everybody, for you and for me, actually. Because <laughs> if you do the Tidely app, it automatically sends your tithe to Tidely, then Tidely to our bank, and it has your name on it. You don't have to put your name on, you don't have to do anything special, you just do what you do through Tithely and it's all good. If you want to do it by electronic um, funds transfer from your bank to our bank, we do need you to put a reference on there. On the card we've got references 90TCH and then your surname. Remember, you've got to put your surname so then I can keep a record of what you're giving. And if you feel that God hasn't, hasn't come through to for you and doesn't look after you over those 90 days, I can keep a tally of what you've given and give it back to you if that's what you desire. But we don't believe that's going to happen, do we? God always comes through. He's a good, good father. Wow. Thank you. Uh, yes, we've signed that in Dayford so that we know when your 90 days is starting uh, because someone may have put one in last week or someone may actually put one in next week when they think about it. So you do need, need to put uh, the date on there. Our biggest big account details are there. And you go, I want the whole church knowing what I give. Well, they won't. Me, Catherine, and Tidely, and Westpac. That's it. Man, they were serious, they, Catherine? Thank you, Catherine. Would you give Catherine a big round of applause for coming up this morning? I just want to tell you that July has been such an exciting month for Spires Light Church. The road has stopped people coming in because people need, need, they just need an easy way to get in. And we want to make it as easy as. That's why I said I'm going to throw a party when that road is open by the end of the week. Um, the signs down there and I'll look with And everyone's going to know and everyone will be back. It's the road open party next weekend, should that road be open. The other things are going to happen. And the road will be open on Tuesday. Uh, this is Tuesday the 24th because we've got a prayer meeting here. Right, Tuesday evening, 7.30, have your home way before 9 o'clock. And uh, also Tuesday morning, play group. Play group started last week, yeah? yeah. Yes, it did. Would you give uh, a big encouragement for our evening this week? Thank you all. And uh, Gordon, my newest, bestest friend who oversees this, he told me it'd be open on Tuesday for you, Gordon. And two of the guys, when I chatted to them on Friday to get it open again, in time for you, two of them were sitting in the gazebo. And the other guys got on their case, what are you doing there, gazebo? And they go, well, it's a church, we're praying, aren't we? We're praying that we're going to have an early knock-off. And I said, you'll get an early knock-off when you get the road open again. <laughs> and Sean said the same. And so, there we go. We've got people on our property pretending they're praying anyway. 31st, <laughs> Tuesday the 31st, road open. And that's when our connect groups start. Right? All connect groups in here, like the Saturday morning one and the Thursday morning one, all connect groups in here. There will be refreshments, there will be tea and coffee and hot chocolate. Some of you might want a book, and some of you, I've been saying this, but you need to get your name down on the clipboard. And uh, in order to do that, I've asked someone this morning, the best clipboard person I could find to work the crowd after the service, all right, while you're eating in the cafe, eating good stuff that's there to help you move along. And the best, best person, clipboard person, would be Lara. Right. I uh, arrived back in Perth last Saturday from the Hillsong Conference, and the Hillsong Conference, and uh, I come from a big family. There are eight of us. We have seven siblings. My sister's the oldest, and all boys from there on. I'm a lucky girl. I have all those fellas. And uh, I'm third in the pecking order. All of my siblings, uh, apart from Alan, who's next down the pecking order for me, and myself, Lillian, by the Brisbane or the Gold Coast, uh, I obviously live here in beautiful Val Davis, and Alan lived in uh, the South Burnham area of Queensland, and uh, by the, I knew that he was ill, and he'd been ill for a long, long time, fighting a battle with cancer, and I'd only been home about an hour from Sydney when I got the message that he passed away. And uh, although we, we knew that that was, that was what was going to happen and probably happen this year, it still messes with you. And it messes with me right now just talking about it. And the funeral is on Thursday. Alan asked me, oh, when he was first diagnosed with cancer 10 years ago, would I do his funeral service? And I said, yeah, that's fine. They gave him nine months to live and he joked his way through it. Cheerful heart is good medicine and he got 10 years out of it. He rang me in April. He rang our office regularly. Our staff know Alan so well. 
they probably know him better than his family members because he'd ring and, and uh, they would say, your brother's on the phone, do you want to talk? And I'd say, which brother? And they'd say, well, it's Alan. And I'd go, well, I'll tell him I'll call him back. I'm always in a meeting. And I would call him back and Mandy would chatter to him as Mandy can do. So two chatterboxes going out, so they've got to go to the right world. Well. And uh, he, he, he wanted to know if I remembered what I promised him. And I, I'm not sure that, that this June he wants to talk about. Maybe he's met a woman, he wants to get married, he wants to do the well, I don't know. So I said, you need to remind me what I promised. He said, well, it'll be my funeral. And I said, yes, I would. So uh, he's passed away last Saturday and had the funeral on Thursday morning. And, Thursday right? and I'm travelling to Queensland on Wednesday afternoon to do the service and some of my brothers will be in touch with me as we put the eulogy together. Memories. And uh, that will mess with you. I'm okay now. Uh, when I stand up, oh, he booked the Anglican. This brother of mine, I mean, it's like he was going on a trip. He booked all the stuff. You know, he booked the, booked the entertainment. <laughs> he booked the... He booked the, the, the travel people, the funeral directors. He, he booked the Anglican church in the little town uh, that he lived in for the last several years. And uh, doing processing all this, it got me to think about, that's a rural area where he is, a little town, probably about five, 6,000 people. Not the town that we grew up in. We were, we were in the central burner. But very, very similar to the surrounding dairy farming territory and crop territory. And, and we grew crops. We would grow barley and wheat, another crop called sorghum, which most Western Australians aren't familiar with. We grow a lot of acres that feed that pigs and feed that uh, chooks, and we grew a lot of that. What, what we had, we had to deal with, and doing a eulogy makes you think about all these things. We are pests. We are devourers of our crop. Lots of them. I think once in my time growing up there, we had locusts. You know, that's a Bible thing, locusts. They'll, be, they'll destroy your crop, they'll devour it. We didn't generally have locusts. We had parrots. We had parrots. And what we did, uh, we got this thing from the hardware store. Uh, not sure what was in it. You poured water in it, you put something or other else in there. And you put a scarecrow near it that looked like he had a shotgun. Uh, and uh, seven brothers did have shotguns and uh, the parrots were on notice. And this thing would go off at a time, every half an hour, it would sound like a shot. Parrots would just, they'd just scurry, they'd be gone. They are devourers, you want to get rid of the devourers. You don't want devourers devouring your life, your health, your finance, or your time. Yep. We would get rid of the devourers, Father in heaven. This morning our prayer is that you would take care of the devourers. And that's your promise to us, Father. Thank you for your promise. God is wanting to underscore a promise to his people that, that he made long ago, and his promises remain true today. They're true and dependable. And this particular promise that I want to talk to you about is about God opening the windows of heaven and pouring out so much of an overflowing blessing for each one of us when we tithe. And in addition to that, he will rebuke the devourer. Uh, the original readers of, of this promise were essentially in, engaged in, in agrarian industries, farming and crops and the like, and the devourers for them often were the locusts, were the other pests that would reduce what should have been a, 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 an abundant crop, as we used to say on the farm, we've got a bumper crop coming today, Fred. They would reduce the bumper crop and the harvest to a very poor outcome. The devil is a devourer. Are you with me this morning? The devil is a devourer. He's a devourer of the abundant life that Jesus offers us. The interest on your credit card is a devourer. You know, I hear someone say, tell me about it. <laughs> oh, man, man. Uh, God, God promises not only to pour out an abundant blessing for you, but also to rebuke the devourer. Wh whether the devourer is the locust, whether the devourer 
is, is the parents, whether the devourer is the credit card interest, whether the devourer is, is just the devil. And when God rebukes the devourer, it's not as if he just comes out with an angry outburst like, like the shot of the whatever we had to frighten the parrots away. Uh, when God rebukes the devourer, the devourer is not just rebuked like he heard a bad word. The devourer is not going to devour you anymore. Yep. That's the promise God has. Uh, so what do you need to do in order to see and hear the windows of heaven open and uh, have the devourer rebuked? Well, here we go on your screen. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 in your Revised Standard Version. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby it put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven. What did I hear? That sounded like windows to me. Someone must be tithing. I think I hear the windows of heaven opening and pour out for you, pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will what? Rebuke the devourer of you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field that shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. I, uh, I think I told one of the services last weekend, a uh, weekend, a couple of weekends ago, after the service, a guy that came here, first time he'd ever been to church, and he has a Muslim background, and uh, he's Muslim. And he said he'd never been to Christian church before to this one. He went on to say, but, well, you know, you're just born either a Muslim or a Christian. That's the way it is. Well, well I wasn't born either. Huh? I did go to church a few times when I was a little kid with my parents. But I would say from the age of 13 to the age of 30, I did not. I had nothing to do with it. Then I met my bride, and we came over to Perth. We married her now. We, we still didn't go to church. Our kids didn't go to church. At, at, at the age of 30, a whole lot of circumstances, I'm not going to tell you about today because I'm going to tell you some other time, I surrendered my life to Christ. It was just after Easter. My wife thought I'd gone nuts. But I surrendered my life to Christ and we began to attend church and she surrendered her life to Christ and, and uh, we met a couple in that church. Uh, their names were John and Lorraine Walker and, and they, she was a nurse, like that's what she did for a living and, and he did the x-rays at the local hospital in Midland and uh, they became our mentors. And John would give me books and I was like a sponge just soaking this stuff up. It was about the nature of God, it was about salvation, it was about the Holy Spirit, it was about heaven. Then one day he gave me this book, and it had on bold on the front of the book, uh, the Tibby. <laughs> and I said, John, what's the Tibby? He said, let me straighten out a bit, Gordon. He said, it's actually pronounced tithe. And this is what he did with me. Cheek of me. He said, would you say it with me? Tithe. And I go, Tibby. <laughs> and I said, tithe. He said, the other thing I need to tell you, it's, it's a tenth of, of your income. And I did what lots of other people have done with me since. He said, before or after tax. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you even ask that? I did. I think about the genius of the tithe. The genius of the tithe. It's percentage giving. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Percentage giving. That means that the person who earns more gives more. I think you try that down at Bunnings. You go to buy your, your thing and you see this other guy and you know that he's on a good... You go, why are you charging me that? You charge me the same as him. Charge him more, charge me less. Because he earns more. Yeah. And they go, what? You try that at the, the cinema, the movies. That someone comes in there and goes, on, he's, he's got a good living. And why are you charging me the same as him? But surely it should be percentage. Or you go to a restaurant. I went to a restaurant yesterday morning. Had breakfast out with the board. And I watched for the people that ordered the same meal as I did. I thought it was quite cheeky because they earned more than me. And, and they paid the same as me. But that's not right. Why, we, why can't we tithe here at the restaurant? Yeah. Hey, why can't we? I would get about $5 breakfast, you know. Yeah. It's going to be 22. 
the, the genius of the day. It is percentage giving. And well meaning people, uh, not only raise the question as before after tax, they go, I think it's just old covenant, you know, it's not for today. And I go, who told you that? Where in the wide world did you get that from? Jesus commented on the tithe, 10%, uh, in teaching the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, about justice and mercy and faithfulness, and this is what he said. It should be on your screen, coming up now. Matthew 23, 23 in your NLT. Uh, no, that's not the right... Well, he's got some of these. Uh, let's go here. I, don't, I wasn't going to do the hypocrite speech, all right? I, I want you to feel good about it. For you are careful to tithe even the tithe, tiniest income from your herb gardens. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy and faith. You should tithe. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus. I'm, I'm going with what Jesus said rather than what some other religious person in your church said. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Jesus said yes to tithe. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 puts forward a case for the tithe in order to remunerate full-time gospel workers in the New Covenant. And what he does, before he, 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 he gives examples, you know, of uh, individuals receiving their living from the industry or the activity in which they are engaged in their daytime experience. He says a soldier doesn't serve in the military at his own expense. The military people pay him. He goes, an ox uh, treading out the grain is allowed to eat some of the grain. He goes, a farmer should eat some of his harvest. Uh, growing up on a farm, if we had to grow our own stuff, man, we, we would have gone, we would have starved. We, we, what we grew, we ate. And then he goes, a, a gospel worker should receive remuneration from the people of the church. Yep. He says. And he writes this, 1 Corinthians 9. In the same way, everyone say it with me, in the same way, in the same way, in the same way. And the question is in the same way as what? In the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel in the same way as what? Well, in the book, verses preceding that, when you get home, check it out, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, start from verse 1 and go all the way through. He, he's just said, in the same way as the Levites, the temple workers, receive their living from the tithe. In the same way. So if someone comes up to you and says, Old Testament, Old Covenant, you go in the same way. Like that. And they laugh. In the same way. In the same way. It means that the Levites were paid by the tithe and the gospel workers in the new covenant will be paid by the tithe. Hey, by the way, how many of you got how many of you got our app? And the rest of you, why haven't you? And get it and check it out and read my blogs on there. Right? Read them. Get the app. If you don't know how to get the app, see myself or Catherine over a hot chocolate after the service in the cafe. Right? You up for it? Okay. How, so, so if the tithe is to pay the staff, how about buying land and buildings and stuff like that? Huh? Because the government doesn't buy them for us and the denomination doesn't, we buy them ourselves. How do we do that? Launching new ministries and other expenses like that in church. How do, how do we cover those? Well, with generous giving over and above the... Uh -huh. The generosity factor. People giving generously over and above the tithe. And I just want to read it because Paul touches on that too. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 uh, is not about the tithe, it's about generous giving. Uh, and now, brothers and sisters... We know that we, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches, northern Greece, uh, in the midst of, uh, that would be like Thessalonica and Philippi, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their ex uh, extreme poverty, they weren't doing well financially, but they were still givers, that's the point he's making, uh, well up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability even on their own. In another translation it says, they pleaded with us for the privilege of giving. You, you know what that's like? That's like the bucket has gone past. Steve passed me the bucket. I was lost in wonder and praise when Steve passed me the bucket this morning. He had nudged me a few times. <laughs> me the bucket. That's like a bucket went past and you go, oh man, they missed me. 
Well, man, I didn't put in what I meant to put in. I only gave a little bit. And hey, would you bring back the bucket? I want to put more in the bucket. Bring it back. They pleaded. Uh, it's because of the generosity of giving that we were able to purchase this land. We bought the land. We put the dough in. I had a visit on Monday, Catherine, I think it was, yeah, from Pastor Ken O'Reilly. He's been pastor of Baptist Church. And since then he moved around a bit, moved into Tasmania. And his kids stayed here and they got married. And one's about to give birth and he had his first grandchild. So he popped in to see me. And I said, Ken, do you remember that car park there? He said, yeah, you and I stood there when it was just limestone before it was sealed. And he said, a man came to you and he was in tears. And you went and chatted to him. And he said, and when you came back, I said, is he okay? And he said, and you just got excited and started to party and dance. I go, that, that was right. The guy gave me 10 grand in an envelope. Uh, this wasn't a check. These were like $100 bills in an envelope. And he put it in my pocket. And his mother had died and he'd come into some money and, and that's what he said to me. He was quite emotional to get that, you know. His mum, he said, Mum told me to give this to you. Ken said, how do you do that? I got that, I don't do anything. I just got hot through people. And that 10 grand went to finish off that car park, right? And, and, and I think about that, it's the generosity. That's how we, that's, it's nowhere else. It's the tithe plus the generosity. So that's the background of the genius of tithing. When you first commit to God through faith in Christ, if you're like me, this will seem a little bit odd. It's the tithy and you wonder, you know, the church people just grab your dough. Of course, I've heard that said, and so have you. I've even said yourself, just want your money. That's all they're always talking about. God wants your heart. And in getting your heart, he wants to put the keys to the windows of heaven in your hands so that you can unlock those so that he will pour out an overflowing blessing to you. And so the prophet Malachi actually describes uh, giving the tithe or not giving the tithe as either honouring God or robbing from him. Check that out in Malachi 3. Malachi 3.10, uh, bring, in, in you know, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Hello. <laughs> Someone's got the keys, because they tithe and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store. So the immediate, this is the immediate result of you tithing are two things, twofold. Number one, there is food in God's storehouse, the local church. Number two, he's opened those windows because you've now got the key and he's poured into your lap a blessing, an overflowing blessing, too much for you to handle. It's just a big blessing. Malachi 3, 10 and 11 in the revised standard version. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the what? <laughs> Says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven. Someone's tithing. I hear the windows clanking open uh, for, for you. And pour down for you an overflowing blessing. What else? What else? I will rebuke the devourer for you. So it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the fields shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. All right, devourers. <laughs> God, since you tithe, it's going, all right, devourers. You locusts. You parrots. You... Credit card debt, you devil. You've got the rebuke of the Lord on you and there'll be no more devouring from you. And, and I just want to tell you, I have answered the challenge of the Lord. I've put him to the test and he has fulfilled his promise to me for decades. Yeah, me too. Sometimes I wonder. Sometimes he tests me back. I think it's not going to come out. I interviewed uh, Michelle up here some weeks ago, months ago. Right up, and she went through the same thing. When you lose a job, you go, ooh. Well, actually, if you lose your job, you're not getting so much income, so guess what? You're not tithing so much, right? You think about that. You think about that. Now, the rebuke of the Lord. The heavenly windows are open. The devourer is rebuked, and he is stopped in his tracks, and God's abundance is poured out to you, the tither. <laughs> well, when you consider, am I going to tithe or not? And this is tough for some of you, because you think, hey, you put, the, put the screws on me. No, it's up to you. It's up to you, you're going to need to process this. And this is how I remember in those early days. I'm going to, John Walker, why did you come around and give me the book called The Tibby? Why did you do that? If I give my 
10% of my salary to God? How in the wide world am I going to balance my budget now when I already have no margin? And I'll tell you what he said to me. He said, well, you need to do a proper budget, don't you? Because you probably haven't got one. I had to know that. So <laughs> I'm a good, good father and I actually know what you're up to. And you need to be more measured on this. Oh, we're going to give 10% on this. God hears our thoughts and he says to us, why don't you test my promise to you to pour out an overflowing blessing into your lap and also rebuke the devourer for you. God said, that's what I promised you. That's what I promised you when you tithe. So he said, launch out and give it a go. Yep. It's up to you. And, and you may well say as I did, but according to my understanding, I can't afford the tithe. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's what God says to me and that's what God says to you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in your new king chain. Trust in the Lord with what? Lord. All your heart. And lean where? Not on your own understanding. I said, according to my understanding, I can't. I can't afford it. It's going to break the bank on my bank. You're leaning on your own understanding, Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will what? He shall direct your heart. So where will you lean? Lean. Where are you going to lean? You're going to lean on your own understanding? I've got degrees. I have university degrees, and, and if you don't have one, and students, you'll you get one, I'm sure you will. Some of you just started tertiary education this year because you graduated from high school last year, and you're going to get things, and you need to get that understanding. What you need to do is to put your understanding in the context of understanding God. Yeah. And while you lean on yours to a measure, you lean on God's to the full measure. Yeah. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. So where are you going to lean? You're going to lean wholeheartedly on the understanding God gives you. What or who will you lean on or depend on? Your understanding on God's promise and God's provision. That's where to lean. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 9. Here we go. Honour the Lord with your what? Well. And with the first fruits. That would be the tenth. Of all your crops, you go, well, I don't have a crop, so I'm not growing barley or wheat or sorghum. No, but you've got a crop. You're working for an employer. You're working, that's your crop right there. God's understanding. God's, understanding. God's saying, get this understanding. Give me a tenth, and you will do much better than you were doing when you hung on to the tenth. I want to give you this one. Thank you, Mark. Proverbs 11.24 in the message. The world of the generous gets what? Larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. God wants to say, wait a minute. You don't want to give the tenth. You want to give some amount because that's, you know, you've got to do that. Wait a minute. He's going to give you more money because he is God and you are not. That's his understanding. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and done evil. This will, oh, this is good. He's rebuking the devourer here. You've got to get this. It's not just about money for you. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And sometimes when you've been doing the hard yards, even the bones begin to ache. And so today we launched the 90 day tithe challenge. Here's how it works. You promised to tithe for 90 days. You promise to trust God to come through for you according to His promises. And if after 90 days you feel like that it just didn't work and God didn't come through for you and things aren't going so well, well then my finance officer will refund that tithe money from those 90 days. The promise of this challenge and the initiative is not about the church being blessed. Hey, when all the church people are blessed, the church is blessed. Yeah. But that's not the point. It's about you stepping out in faith, being abundantly blessed, not only financially, but in your body and your bones. Yeah. I, want, I want my body and my bones to be healthy. Now, this initiative gives you the opportunity to step out into God's plan and receive the abundance from Him. 
That's only in this plan to put out in the car. Right? You go, I'm going to fill that in this morning. What do you want me to do with it? I want you to give it to Catherine with the meetings, that's why. So, well, I just need another day to pray about it. Good. Come back tonight and stick it in a bucket. If you're in the front row, Steve will pass the bucket to you. Right? If you're not in the front row, there'll be another bucket passer. And you put that in the bucket. Cool God is such a good, good God. He's a good, good Father. Isn't he? Yes. I want to pray. I want to pray. Father in heaven, we want to lean into your understanding. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. You're a good, good Father. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not open the windows of heaven. we anticipate hearing the windows of heaven opening and so much blessing coming down into the laps of your people and hearing your voice rebuke the devourer thank you Lord God in Jesus wonderful name Amen. Amen. Let's stand church, let's stand together you know church uh, whenever I talk about me in the beginning uh, the Christian walk, you know, at age 30. You know, what if I'd begun at age 15? Man, I'd have been dangerous. <laughs> if you haven't begun, if you've not yet begun the Christian walk, there will never be a better time of the day, regardless of what your age is. I met a guy in his 90s, the Lord once. Thank the Lord, baptized me. That's a bit of a trick when you're in your 90s. You hope they come back out of the water again. <laughs> now, I baptize much younger people. And I'm looking forward to doing some baptizing sometime in the near future, right? Someone in the house needs to say, I'm going forward with Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. God has done so many miracles in the past. We have to stop doing miracles. He's a miracle-making God. And he wants to do some more. He wants you to see a miracle in your life and in your surrounds. Let's sing a song this morning. devouring their finances, their health, their relationships, their space. Thank you, promise, Father God. Thank you. Lord, our Lord God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you give Jesus a big round of applause? <laughs> Just a couple of things before we uh, move out into the cafe. It's Food in the cafe? Yes, there is. Raisin toast, toast, and maybe some other goodies. Barista coffee, hot chocolate, mocha, long black, whatever that means, and uh, things like that. And the bar will be circulating around with a clipboard. If your name's not on there, or well, the Connect Group study starting on the 31st, please sir, put it on the agenda. Because if you don't, please love me with that. You, you'll please love me with that. And uh, next Tuesday, of course, is a prayer meeting right here. Bless you all. And uh, all tonight, come back tonight. We've got a great message tonight. It's titled, Audacious Prayer. Have the audacity to pray. Big prayers to God, all right? Audacious prayer. I look forward to preaching that tonight. Hope you'll be here. Bring someone with you. Let's fill the house tonight. Be blessed. Have a fantastic day.